but I'm very grateful for his friendship and his fellowship over the years, uh, as long as I could know him, before the Lord took him home. You say, who's, who's Pastor Bowler? He's over there. That's a picture over there by the window, okay? And he asked me if, because uh, I was in evangelism, okay? And I came and I preached, and he knew I had a radio ministry for about 25 years in, in Wisconsin. And he had a television ministry, and uh, he said, Brother Cliff, he said, I want you to be my successor. <coughs> I said, well, I'll have to pray about that. He said, you don't have to. I already did, he said. <coughs> so... <coughs> I said, well, okay. I said, I'll have to talk to my wife. That you'll have to do, he said. <laughs> Brother Cliff, I can't do that for you. <clears throat> now, there's, there's something you have to do. And so I did, and we felt led of the Lord to uh, take this, this strategic work, not the largest work around. We had incredible blessing up in... Milwaukee area, Wisconsin, for 35 years. We had over 300 in our church, and the Lord just blessed us uh, with bus ministry, and Christian school ministry, and uh, radio ministry. Uh, it was just a blessing. We had some TV ministry, not a lot, but that was when VCY was just getting, getting going, and uh, we had a great time. But the reason I bring this up is he called me. He said, Brother Cliff, I want you to come over <clears throat> to the hospital. And then he went on and, and said, I, I believe God wants you to, to take this work. And I said, okay. And I said to him, what would you like me to carry on what what do you feel the legacy of your ministry is that I can honor you right and without a without a, a hitch you know without really much of a, a pause at all well that's simple he said the book the blood and the blessed hope <clears throat> and so we have endeavored to be faithful to the book and the blood and the blessed hope <clears throat> That's what we've endeavored to do. And I think he would be very happy that the ministry that he had started, and now when we go by Euclid, if you know where Euclid is and University, he used to have the, uh, I'm thinking Monumental, but it's uh, not Monumental Baptist, Metropolitan, Metropolitan Baptist uh, was there. For those of you who've been around a while, there was, I mean, what an incredible place for a church, but it burned down, I guess. And, uh, and I think he went into evangelism, came back and started this Temple Baptist. So we endeavor to keep the legacy uh, going, the book, the blood, and the blessed hope. <coughs> and uh, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, <coughs> if we could. And uh, we're just going to take some time and we're going to talk about the Lord's Supper. Now some... Some churches call it communion, but the churches that call it communion usually put a wrong emphasis on it, that it, it, it has a sacramental grace, okay? So we'll talk about the Lord's Supper in, in kind of simple terms so that you can <coughs> understand it, okay? Uh, Notice it says here, Be ye followers of me, verse 1, even as I also am of Christ. Everyone, verse 2. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. <clears throat> okay? So this was not a suggestion by Paul. <clears throat> this was a command. 
Okay, the, the word katekete is an imperative. Keep. In other words, make sure you keep the ordinances. Why is that <clears throat> so important? We had, what a wonderful, it's, it, in a way, it's, I know it's been a tough month, but in a way it's been a wonderful month. Because we had a baptism, we had souls saved, right? And praise the Lord, that's, that's always a good month. I think of Ida and Imelda. We're, we're, we're going back. We're, go, we're going to follow these people up. I think of Cassandra. You know what? <coughs> Delia is, is, has cancer, as many of you know, and she's undergone chemotherapy and radiation, and, and she just had a terrible night last night. She, she felt so bad that she missed today. But I want to say what a blessing, not only Kay, but I, we, we picked up Kay, and then I came down, and there was, was Cassandra waiting right at the, the curb so she could come. Now, the door were soul winning. The door was soul winning. And it works. Now, I'm not going to say that it's always, always a, a, a wonderful time. It isn't. Uh, <clears throat> but then, you know what John said? John said, <clears throat> he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Yeah. Amen? Not just that they made a profession of faith, but that it affected their lives and changed their lives, okay? And that's what I see in Kay. And that's what I see in Cassandra, you know. They not only received Christ, but they've been faithful. I mean, seriously. Uh, that's the joy of our hearts. That when we see not just somebody who makes a profession or Praise a prayer to get you off their back, right? We've all had that happen, all right? Okay, I'll pray this prayer to get you out of my face, you know, so to speak. Uh, but <clears throat> here we are, and see, the Christian life is more than just making a profession of faith. The Christian life is following through and realizing all... I. I gave, I gave my life for thee. <clears throat> Al Smith, uh, this is way out of print. You know how much these are now? If you go online, try to get one of these hymn histories from Al Smith, they're like $900. Yeah, you can't find them. They're out of print. <clears throat> I gave my life for thee. <clears throat> I noticed. Uh, Frances Ridley Havergal, she went through a lot of suffering was writing to a friend who had asked the authorship of the song. I'll let Miss Havergal continue. I was 23 at the time. I was visiting friends in Germany. I had been sightseeing and was very tired. I was staying as a guest in the home of a well-known pastor. On the wall of his home was a picture, and the picture of the crucifixion, with the words, I gave my life for thee. Wow. That struck me, she said. It seemed as if I heard a voice asking me, what hast thou given for me? <laughs> right? Immediately in a flash, the words came to me. I scribbled them in a few minutes on the back of a circular I had in my purse. I read them over and thought, well, this is not a worthwhile poetry anyhow, so I won't bother to write it out on paper. Then I thought, why keep it at all? So I crumpled it up and threw it into the burning fire in the fireplace. Somehow, it did not, it not ignite, <laughs> but it fell onto the hearth. As I saw it there, a sudden impulse made me pick it back up. <laughs> it was crumpled and singed and smoky, but I put it in my purse. Some days later, when I was back in England, I went to see an old woman in her poor house. She began talking to me about her savior, as she always did. She began talking. I, I thought if, if she would see, the simple woman would care for the verses, which I sure were of no value to anyone. I read them to her, and to my delight and to surprise, she was so pleased that she requested a copy for herself. You know, we stopped by, and uh, <clears throat> we met a lady named April last week, right? And she started quoting a wonderful poem to me, and I said, I want to get a copy of that. It was incredible. Wonderful poem. 
And uh, so I'm going back there just to get a copy of that poem, okay? This is kind of that situation. The hymn proved to be one of the first. So this was the first hymn that Francis Ridley Havergal wrote. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou mightst ransom be and quickened from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? She went on to write, Who is on the Lord's side? That's a good one, hey? How about this one? Take my life and let it be. Let me tell you something, folks. And I say this. The great hymns that we have in our hymnal were not written after watching Saturday morning cartoons. I think the great hymns we have today born, are born out of the crucible of suffering. Between uh, be, suffering, betrayal, and personal pain. I think of Horatio Spafford, okay, who after the, the great fire in Chicago, right, he sent his wife, and he was a businessman, he was helping uh, Moody with his work, his great work. And he sent his wife and four daughters on the ship, the Le Havre. You can look it up. La Le Havre. <clears throat> and sent her so, uh, across to England. And about halfway there, there was fog. And that ship rammed another ship and went down very quickly. His wife was rescued and telegraphed her dear husband, Horatio Spofford, and saved alone. Two words. That's it. His heart was crushed. Four beautiful daughters. And uh, he, he just couldn't believe it. So he went over. <coughs> he headed over. Can you turn this up? He headed over to uh, England. And on the ship, <coughs> you know, those, those shipmasters, the, the camp, they know, you know exactly where things are in the, in the ocean, right? And so he asked Horatio to come, and he said, this is the spot where they went down. And we never, they never recovered the bodies. Sad. And so God and the Holy Spirit worked in Brother Spofford's life at that point. And uh, he wrote these words, When peace like a river attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Can we say that? Okay, what was he saying in that song? He's saying in the midst of this crushing, crushing uh, loss of his four precious daughters. My daughter's on the road this very minute with our the, the, the most beautiful little grandson you ever saw in your life. Just, I mean, just steal your heart. Hmm. You know, he come in this morning. I was still in bed, man. He was up crack of dawn, man. He come in there. I got him this hat. We went out and I bought him this hat, a badger hat. It, it, and he, he had this badger hat on. Gramster, look at my hat. <clears throat> you know? <clears throat> yeah, that's great. Yeah. <clears throat> and... Uh, you know, he just, he said, Gramster, read me a story. Talk to me. Yeah, six in the morning. <clears throat> yeah, I'm real into that. <clears throat> but you know, for him, it was like the world to him. Just to read a little story or, or read some of the scripture. And I told him a missionary story. He just loved it. <clears throat> I, told, I tell that story about the missionary, you know, who went over. Can't remember his name right now. But he went over and, and, and he, he was in an accident and he, he had to get his leg amputated underneath the knee, right? And so he had a cork leg, right? So he went to these cannibals, right? <coughs> and they, they started firing up the pot, man. We're eating you, buddy, <coughs> you know? And so the guy took out his knife, <coughs> right? He said, well, before you eat me, you need to taste me, right? You need to taste me. And so he cut off a piece of that cork. He said, try and see what I taste like first. And so the chief, okay, okay. So he put that in the, 
That's terrible. We're not eating you. You taste awful. <coughs> you don't even bleed. <coughs> so the man went on to win that tribe to Christ. It was great. So these hymns, Charles Weigel, I think of him, an evangelist, preached all over America for a while. His wife put up with it for a few years, and then she said, you know what, this life isn't for me. I'm, I'm going back to the world. And she did. She uh, hated, she hated him as far as, you know, living for Jesus. She wanted to go back to the world. She went out to L.A. Well, long story short, she repented, which was a blessing. But in that loneliness and that sorrow and that desertion and that betrayal, this man wrote, I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus, since I found in him a friend so strong and true. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. And so, even though you're going through this crushing heartbreak, God can use it for his glory. How about Luther Bridgers? He lost his wife and three sons in a fire. He was a pastor, and he went to his in-laws. Luther Bridgers lost his wife and his children. They couldn't go even go back in. The fire had engulfed the house. He went on to write these words. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. He keeps me singing. Of course, Fanny Crosby, she lost her earthly sight, but she had a wonderful, keen, heavenly sight, didn't she? Wonderful, keen, heavenly sight. She went on to write, Blessed Assurance, to God be the glory, my Savior first of all. How about John Newton? John Newton. <clears throat> Many of you don't know him. He was the son of a slave ship captain. A drunkard. His mother, though, was godly, and she prayed for him every day that he would come to know Jesus as his Savior. Well, <clears throat> Long story short, John Newton became his own uh, captain of a slave ship. Horrible, horrible, terrible business, right? Wicked. I mean, his own crew hated him so much that when a, a wave took him over, they wouldn't even send a boat out for him. They just harpooned him and dragged him in like a fish, like a drunken fish that he was. And threw him in his quarters. But that was the turning point for John Newton. And he went on to get saved and become one of the greatest pastors of England and literally changed the world by writing this great song. <clears throat> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Not only did, was it a testimony of his life, but God used that him to stop the slave trading in Europe and eventually America. Wonderful. Ron Hamilton, Rejoice in the Lord. I think it's Brother Frank's favorite song. Lost his eye. On we could go. And then it was brought to me, Helen, Helen Holworth Lemel, <clears throat> wrote this. He said, are you feeling discouraged, depressed, or even despairing? Helen Howarth Lemmel experienced the same when she was struck by a disease that caused her to go blind. And as a result, was abandoned by her husband. Can you imagine it? Yet amidst her situation, she turned to Jesus and wrote over 500 hymns of praise and worship. This beloved hymn came out in 1922, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You know, people go through trials and heartaches and burdens, but they continue serving the Lord, and we need to do the same. So as we come to the Lord's table, I want you to notice several things it causes us to do. First of all, we need, it causes us to look back for a moment. <coughs> To look back. I uh, praise you, brethren. You remember in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. So, back in the Old Testament, 
what happened? God delivered the children of Israel, right? And they had a thing called the Passover, right? Remember that? The Passover. And they took the blood, okay, and put it, boy, I'm glad I got this, on the doorpost, right? Now, where did they put the blood on the doorpost? Anybody know? In the top, the sides, and down below. In the shape of what? The cross. Amen? So even way back in Exodus, God was giving them the cross. And Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. Right? John the Baptist himself said, Behold! The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. What a thrill to know that we have the Lamb of God. And even in Revelation, where it speaks of, and I saw that lion the other day, that massive lion, and he was hiding way in the back, right? I mean, he had a roar, this guy, right? You could hear him, but you couldn't see him. And then all of a sudden, he came sauntering out. Big, massive head. I thought, man, I didn't know they had this. I'm sure he's got a name, Leo, maybe. I don't know what his name is. <coughs> but <coughs> Leo the lion, whatever. So he came, and there was a big perch. And he climbed right up that thing, and he sat on that perch. Looked around and said, I'm the king of the jungle. Right? Jesus is the lion lamb. <coughs> the fulfillment of the lion of the tribe of Judah and the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. I want us to focus for a moment as we look back on the sufferings of Christ. Can we even be, imagine the suffering that he went through? <clears throat> Let's go back to Isaiah 53, if you would. Can you find it right there in the middle of your Bible? Isaiah 53, just for a few moments, and we're going to receive the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> Isaiah 53, you know, it's hard for me to, to really fathom a Jewish person not seeing Jesus in this passage, right? It exactly describes Christ and his ministry. Who hath believed our report? Isaiah 53, 1. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. <coughs> he is what? Let's read it together. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Then we have this word. What's the next word? Anybody know? Surely. Not maybe. Not hope so, right? Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Everyone, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Everyone, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. So uh, salvation really is going in at the first all, right, and coming out at the last all. Amen? So all we like sheep, it starts with all and it ends with all, right? And so we go in at the first all and we come out at the last all and where everything's going to be all right, amen? He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Hey, there's a good example for us. When somebody abuses us or takes advantage of us, right? Just take it to Jesus, right? I want you to see this in verse 9. I'll give you a insight here that just stirred my soul verse 9 and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had no done no violence neither was any deceit in his mouth i want you to see this that word death there even in my margin you'll see it's in the plural right jesus died jesus died 
multiple deaths for us. He died in body, in soul, and spirit for you and I. You say, and I know a lot of evangelists and preachers, they like to, 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 to you know, imagine the ghastly, ghoulish gore that our Savior went through for us. Yes, absolutely. What a ghastly, ghoulish, and gory sight physically. But I want you to see <clears throat> verse 10. Let's read it together, everyone. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. I want you to see that. <clears throat> make his soul an offering. Verse 11, he shall see his father. We're talking about his father seeing his son, right, suffer. He shall see the travail of his what? Soul. So really, the bodily sufferings are minimized. It's the soul sufferings. Let me ask you a question. Would you rather lose a finger or lose a son or a daughter? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the soul sufferings, that's what really hurts us, right? Again, <clears throat> verse 12, he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bare the sin of many. So he, he suffered infinitely physically. He suffered infinitely spiritually. He suffered infinitely mentally. He was separated from his father. Now let me, let me give you a thought here that you can take time on this week. Let me tell you how you can personalize the sufferings of Christ. Here's what you do. You picture yourself as the only sinner in the world. And you picture that Savior. Jesus didn't just die. You know, I know we love to quote John 3.16, and I love John 3.16. For God, what? So loved the world. And so we think, okay, that's good. Like Sherwin Williams, you know, his blood covers the world. You know, No, no, what we need to do is take that, that sacrifice, that, that blood sacrifice, and apply it to ourselves personally so we appreciate it inwardly. Each and every day, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. All right? And so, <clears throat> this suffering of our Savior was not just for the world. It was for me. All right? That takes us to number two. We look back, and then we look within. <clears throat> back to 1 Corinthians 11. All right? This is very important. So, I can't even begin to speak to you about the sufferings of Christ. I can't. No preacher has ever done justice to what the suffering was that he went through. But he gave his all for us. And the question is, Francis Ridley Havergal, what have I done for him? So little. We wimpy American Laodicean Christians. Really sad. When we look down the hallway of history and we see the blood of the martyrs who gladly gave up their lives, we think of those who are even yet today over in Afghanistan and other places are giving their heads for Jesus Christ like John the Baptist or Paul. Let's look within for a moment. 1 Corinthians 11, I want you to see in verse 28, <clears throat> this is very important as we come to the table now. <clears throat> Let's read it together. Ready? Verse 28, uh, 1 Corinthians 11. Everyone? But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. So it's examination time, folks. This isn't quiz time. It's a, a self-examination, and one day we're going to have a final examination, right? And we're going to appear before the Lord himself, and he's going to say, what did you do? <clears throat> See, God wants us to do all that we can with what we have where we are. <clears throat> That's what he has commanded us to do. Do all that you can with what you have where you are. Wonderful little song we used to have on our radio on the, the upward look. It's called, brighten the corner where you are. Amen. And that's what we're supposed to be doing. Brighten the corner where you are. Someone... Maybe not far from you, say, 
we don't police the table. We're not going to say, you can take it, you can't. All right. It's between you and the Lord. But you better be saved and, and, and baptized, you know. I mean, Acts chapter 2 gives us the order, right? And they were glad to receive his word. Were what? Baptized. They were added. And then they broke bread. That's the biblical order. All right? But we do not police the table. All right? So examine yourself. Is there bitterness? Is there anger? Is there worldliness? You know, I was thinking about some people in my life, and they got, they got one foot in the world and one foot with Jesus. <laughs> and it's not going to end well when you, when you live a life like that. So <clears throat> uh, notice back in verse 27. This is very important. <clears throat> verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord. What's the word? Unworthily. Okay. That's a very important word. Circle it. Don't drink, the, eat the bread and drink the word and, and drink his cup unworthily. Shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man, what? Examine himself. We don't go around and say, Okay, if you had your devotions all week, you you know, you're living for God, you've been a soul winner, a testimony. You know, we don't do that. That's between you and the Lord. Kind of like your giving, right? Kind of like your stewardship. That's between you and the Lord. I don't want to know what you're giving. <clears throat> God knows, and he's going to reward you according to what you're doing. All right, stewardship. It's called stewardship. <clears throat> Verse 20 and 29, this is pretty serious. For he that what? Eateth and drinketh what? Unworthily. Now, what does that mean? None of us are worthy, okay? So in that aspect, none of us is worthy, so none of us should take the Lord. No, it doesn't, well, not what it says. Unworth, what? Ili, it's an adverb. And so we don't come to the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. That's what it means. Unworthily, okay? So don't come to the Lord's table and think, well, I belong here. I'm, you know, I've, I've lived for God and, you know, on and on. If you got bitterness and, and, and wrath and strife and, 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 and immorality of any kind, you need to take that to the cross right now as we come to the table. Because look what it says. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Woo! That's pretty strong stuff, not discerning the Lord's body. So we thank God for his body. And his blood. And that's what the two elements represent. His body and his blood. Thank God for his pure and precious body. The Lamb of God. The sinless body. And we can talk about all the practical applications of that. That Jesus really didn't have. Uh, he didn't really need deodorant. <clears throat> I mean there's practical applications to not having a sin. A, a sin cursed body. Right? It was. It was. Uh, a sinless body. Now he has a glorified body. Okay, this is all mystery, right? This this body that he had down here. <laughs> I mean, really, think of it. People just clamored just to touch his garment to be healed. Wow. And so, there was a physical aspect to our Savior. In his precious body and his precious blood. So we're thankful for both. And so as we come, we look within, and then so we look back. It's a real simple outline. We look back to the Passover lamb, of which Christ is the fulfillment. So we celebrate it now. And then we look within, we make sure we don't come in an unworthy manner, and then we look ahead. Why do we look ahead? Because the Lord Jesus isn't done yet. Amen? He's not done. He's coming back. And notice it says here, verse 26. Let's read it together, everyone. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Amen? Now understand that we do this not, we do not believe in transubstantiation. 
as some would teach, that these elements actually turn into the actual body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ? No. We don't believe in consubstantiation. We do not believe that Christ's presence is around the element. We believe that God is pleased when we remember him, right? It's, an, it's a memorial, right? This do in remembrance of me, verse 25. Now, that's very important. This do in remembrance of me. Spurgeon writes, it seems that Christians may forget Christ. Hmm. There could be no need for this loving exhortation if there was not a fearful supposition that our memories might prove treacherous. Nor is this a bare supposition. It is, alas, too well confirmed in our experience, not as a possibility, but as a lamentable fact. It appears almost impossible that those who have been redeemed by the blood of the dying Lamb and loved with an everlasting love by the eternal Son of God should forget that gracious Savior, but if startling to the ear, it alas apparent for the eye to allow us to deny the crime. Forget him who never forgot us? Forget him who poured forth his blood for our sins? What a crime. Let us charge ourselves to bind a heavenly forget-me-not about our hearts as for, for Jesus our beloved, and whatever we let slip, let us hold fast to him. Let us pray this morning as we prepare our hearts. Take some time to, we're going to take time to for just a moment to just uh, confess any sin. Let a man examine himself, the Bible says. And so that we're, that's what we're going to let you do. Let's pray this this morning. Brother Bob, if you would come. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the precious blood of Jesus and that that Savior shed his blood for each one of us, not just the sins of the world in general, but for each one of us sinners and for each one of our sins. Speak to us, Lord. Each and every one of us. We trust that each and every person in this room knows Christ as personal Savior. If you're not sure about your personal salvation, why don't you slip your hand up and let us know. <clears throat> you don't know that song, Bob? Can you, yeah. Can you come? come, please.